I'd like to introduce you to somebody that's down here for the first time. Right down here is our friend Junior Esaculia. I want the church family to know him. And the last time I saw him standing upright, he had a stroke here a few weeks, few, uh, several months ago. But I sure love him. I want to tell you a story. He's a Vietnam vet. And he lived five doors down from me in Long Beach, California on Magnolia Avenue. And I sure am glad to see him tonight. This is the first time he's been able to be in church uh, in about a year and a half or so. Uh, Junior, um, I was one day, my car would not start. And uh, I began to take his grandchildren to church. Uh, he had four grandchildren that lived down the street from me. And, and uh, Linda and, and the kids and I started inviting them to come. And they started coming. And uh, one day, my car wouldn't start, and I was so frustrated. I thought, man, this silly thing won't start. And, and I, I, I had to borrow a, another car to get the kids to school, and I was a new pastor to church. This was just, I was just being a pastor just a few months, and, and uh, my car wasn't working. I thought, man, this is ridiculous. And, and got the kids to school, came back, got a ride back, and, and uh, tried to get it started. It wouldn't start. I, I thought, well, maybe it's the battery, and... And uh, I was out there underneath the hood, and, and Junior walked up to me, and he said, he said uh, what's the problem? I said, I think i got a bad battery. He said, well, I know a battery shop around here that you can go to. And uh, he said, okay. I said, okay, I'll go. And, and uh, you want to go with me? He said, sure. And on the way over there, we began to talk about life and difficult things. And he was raising, at that time, those grandchildren by himself and, and was struggling and having a hard time. And, and I didn't really realize all that at the time, and, but uh, went, over to the, went over to the battery shop, and the guy said, this battery is just fine. There's nothing wrong with it. I said, oh, good night. Come on now. I just now tried to start with it. He goes, no, it's fine. So I went back, put it in there, put the cables back on there, started the car up, and started right up. And uh, I thought, wow, how about that? But as a result of that particular situation, I began to talk to, to Junior and and then several years later, one day I was at lunch on a Thursday afternoon or at home on a Monday. It was a Monday afternoon. And a junior came down to my door and knocked on my door. And he said, Pastor, I, I'm not saved. And uh, can, you, can, you do, can you tell me how to be saved? Because I know if I died, I'd go to hell and I need to be saved. And he, uh, we went to our living room and uh, opened the Bible and sat on the couch, explained the gospel, then we got on our knees and he accepted Jesus Christ as a Savior. And uh, there were some difficult times, difficult times in that area. And one area, though I remember, he's, he uh, was the area of tithing and giving. And uh, he, was, uh, he would tip the Lord and he would, he would give occasionally, but never really the tithe all the way. He just well, didn't trust, didn't, didn't, wasn't grown that place. But... I remember one Sunday evening, he came to church, and he was so happy. He said, Pastor, for the first time, I tithed completely today. For I gave, I gave exactly what God, I gave more than my tithe, and I did that today. He said, next Sunday, I'm going to put a suit on, and I'm coming to church like everybody else around here. <laughs> and I said, that's great, Junior. And on the way home, though, he had a stroke, massive stroke. And just a few hours later, I went to the emergency room, and, and they did not think he was going to live. He was in ICU for several, several weeks. And then uh, through the love of his son, David, and others around him, and nursed back to health, and, and uh, he had the opportunity to move out here. And, he's, he and he and his son moved out here and bought a house in Hammond here and live here. And this is his first service to come. And I sure love him. I'm so glad he's here. Thank you, Junior, for being with us tonight. I know it's difficult, and I'm glad he's here. He's an Armenian guy from up in Fresno, California, and went to Vietnam, and, and his son went out in the, in the paratroopers, too, in the 82nd Airborne. But just a, just a great guy, and I'm glad to see him tonight. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter number 12. Tonight we're going to speak about the spiritual gift of ministry, and uh, we have... Not going to take a long time, but want to go through this. We'll not do a lot of review, but you're familiar with this passage of Scripture. He, he, uh, the first 11 chapters of Romans, the Bible tells us the great plan of salvation for mankind. It begins in chapter 1 with talking about the, the wickedness of man. Chapter 2, it kind of talks about the religiousness, the religious man is damned and, and exiled from God and alienated from God, I should say. 
And then chapter 3, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it doesn't matter who you are. And then it talks about faith through Abraham and that Abraham was, was justified by faith. And then the fact that we can overcome sin and, and uh, God's great plan of salvation. He shares the first 11 verse, chapters of Romans. Chapter 12, though, it says, Now, because you're saved, here's what we ought to do. We ought to present our bodies a living sacrifice to God, wholly acceptable unto Him, which is a reasonable thing. That if He was willing to save us and give us salvation, we ought at least live for Him. And present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, separated, not conformed to this world, but uh, transformed by the way we think we should think differently, holy, righteously, before the Lord. And then, uh, which is our, and he, which, and prove what's acceptable to God. Then he says, there needs to be humility in our hearts. One thing that you certainly want in your life, and I do want in my life, is humility. Because humble people get help from God they need the most. And you want to humble yourself before the Lord. And forget how you think and how you feel and what you want and how it affects you. And think, what is God doing in this situation? I had to figure that out yesterday as I stood in that TSA line. And, uh, and I was thinking, man, this is ridiculous. I'm going to miss my flight. And I was thinking about everyone to blame. I said, where's the supervisor? This is ridiculous. And uh, why couldn't I get in that line instead of this line? This line's the slowest one in the whole stinking airport. And I mean, I'm just going to town in that situation. Why? Because it's all about me. <laughs> I didn't realize it's really not about me. It's about what God's doing, what his plan is, what he wants. And it changes things. But he said, now look, I'm going to give you some gifts, but don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. He's going to tell you there are seven motivational gifts that God's going to tell us about. He says, but don't think more highly about your gift than you ought to think. But think soberly and realize that God has given to every man that gift to profit and to bless others with. And then he says, we're all in one body. And we're, we've got to have unity, unification, and, and selflessness, and humiliation. And then he goes on to tell us that we're members one another. We must have dependence upon each other. I need you, and you need me. And one of the things, I, there's one, two purposes I'd like to do in this whole section is to, number one, is just to let you know that God has gifted you to do something for him. Number two, Realize that God has gifted other people to do things that you can't do as well as they can do. And appreciate your brothers and sisters with different dispositions and different gifts. And don't get frustrated with one another. Realize we need everybody. And God has gifted people to serve Him. Now, I believe that God has given you at least one strong gift. And then, as you and I grow in our maturing process spiritually, God lets us assimilate more strength in the rest of the six gifts that, uh, that are listed here. But let's look at them real quickly. If you can, please, verse number six. Having then gifts differing, according to the grace that's given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. We spent time on that last week. If you were not here, I would suggest that maybe you consider getting the worksheet and the, um, the CD. It might be helpful to you. Number seven, letter, or verse seven, let's read it together, please. Or ministry, let us wait, or he that teacheth on teaching. Our Father, give us wisdom in the next few moments to explain this particular gift of ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Here is, I think, the first one is prophecy, because that has to do with proclaiming God's truth. The way people get saved is someone has to preach the gospel. The way I got saved, someone gave me the gospel. The way the lady got saved, Kathleen, on the plane yesterday, and the people that you witnessed to get saved is because someone explains the gospel to them. Someone proclaims the truth of God's Word. And that's probably, in the simplest way, that is prophesying. Giving people the Word of God or the gospel of Christ. A church who does not exercise soul winning in just time will shrivel down to us four and no more and will no longer penetrate its community or its world. Number two, it is prophets or people who help keep the church straight. And because doctrine determines what? Doctrine determines destiny. What you believe determines where you'll be. One of the big things that, as a pastor that I have to consider all the time is, is, is I've got to watch out for false doctrine. 
Apostle told, told, Apostle Paul told Timothy, I'm, I'm, I want, I'm going to abide, I'm beseeching you to abide still in Ephesus. And the reason was to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now, I'm not very, I'm not a terribly aggressive person. I'm not, a, not somebody who is, is, is looking for a fight. I'm a, I'm a lover, not a fighter. I don't really care about, I don't want to do that. But one thing that I have to be firm on, if somebody says something that disagrees with the Bible, I've got to be true. I have done this before, and it, and it does not fun, but I've had people preach a message in, 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 in our church service. And there was something they said was just absolutely, not the whole message, but something was not true to the Bible. And they were my friend. I love them. I'm not against them. But I have gone to that person after the service. I did this several, a couple years ago. I went to the person. I said, brother, I need to understand, do you believe this or this? Because here's what I believe the Bible says. Do you think something different about that? Because what you said this morning, and I confronted him, and then I went back to the church on Sunday night and said, listen, we heard something this morning that I do not believe is true to the Word of God. And is that fun to do? No. Did it hurt me? Yes. Did I like that? No, sirree. But I have a responsibility. And doctrine determines destiny. And we want to tell you what the Bible says. And, and if I say something that disagrees with the Bible, then I'm wrong and the Bible's right. And I have no problem. I, I want to be true to the Scriptures. If there's areas of opinions, I want to usually say, well, it's the way I see it. This is what I think the Bible's saying. But if I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to be corrected. Because I want to be true more than I want to be popular or, or even right myself. And true to the Scriptures. But prophecy is so important. But the next gift listed in order is ministry. Now, I don't know this to be absolutely true, but... I would say that there's probably more people gifted with this particular gift than any other. I would say most, many of us have this particular gift. It's the gift of ministry. I personally think it's probably my strong suit. It's the gift that probably God gave me uh, to, to operate in. And I don't know that that's the best one for a pastor to do, but it is what I believe that I, I find my greatest energies are, are stimulated through this gift. It's not, and these, are, these are things that come naturally more so to me than other things. If someone has a gift of ruling or organizing, that's not me. I'm not very good at that. Some, there's some other things that I, I even the prophet, I, it's not really me. But this right here probably is something that I would see I can gravitate to. And I think that probably more people in Christendom have this particular strength than any other. That's only my opinion and not necessarily biblical truth. Because ministry is serving. It is work. And I think probably the, the one fellow in the Bible that best epitomizes this particular gift is the man Timothy. Timothy, or Timotheus, as you see in the Bible sometimes, he was raised in Lystra. He was Paul's assistant. I believe probably Joshua was probably gifted. If you would, in the Old Testament, if you want to find a type and shadow of that, it was Joshua in the Old Testament who was gifted to serve. He enjoyed, the, many, many people that are gifted to ministry do not necessarily make a good thing, but they make a good thing better. For instance, I don't think I'd be very good at starting a church and certainly building a building. If, if I had to build a building, I'd probably go to the funny farm. You know, I'm not very good at doing that. I, I get stressed out building a doghouse, you know. I, it's not something I, it would just terrify me. Uh, starting a church, although I, I have had a part in starting different churches, and indirectly and even directly, but it's not something I just like, I, I'm not, I got that pioneer spirit. But the Lord knew that, and He put me in places that were already somewhat structured. And I think oftentimes that's the heart of a, of a, uh, a minister. Let's look at a couple things real quickly because of our time. Uh, let's look at Acts chapter, oh, let's look at Matthew chapter 20. We'll come back to maybe Acts, and Matthew chapter 20 in your Bibles, verse number 20 and 20, 20 through 28. And basically, the Bible says, he that hath ministry, let him wait on our ministry. That word wait is like a waiter, someone who serves another's interest. Who cares for that? 
Proverbs, Matthew chapter 20, and let's look real quickly at verse number 20, what the Bible says. And Jesus is speaking to them. Then came to him uh, the mother of Zebedee's children and with her sons. And this is, this is James and John's mother, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, what wilt thou? And ma'am, what do you need? And she said unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit one on thy right hand, the other on thy left in thy kingdom. And Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye asked. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We're able. So it looks like they were there with mom whenever he asked. Mom says, Look, would you do something for me? I would like John and James to be close to you when you enter your kingdom. And he says, I don't know that you're cut out for that. You think you're able to be baptized and take on the drink of the cup that I, the cup of suffering? And they, the, the men said, yes, we can. We can do it. They were ready to do it. Well, Jesus does that and, and uses this to give them an illustration. Verse 23. And he said unto them, ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized of the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand or on my left, well, it is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. So when the other ten disciples heard the request that uh, Mrs. Zebedee made, they got mad. They said, you jerk. You jerks. There's two of them. He said, how dare you want to be on the right hand of the left hand? That's what I wanted. And that was kind of probably the problem there. But then he says in verse 25, And Jesus called them and said, Ye know that princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they are great exercise authority upon them. He said, it's a pecking order. He said, over the Gentile, the princes, they make sure they are in dominion over this next level. And then those levels, they make sure they put the people under them under their dominion as well. It's a, it's a pecking order. He said it, it's just the way it is in, in the world. In the Gentiles or unsaved people act this way. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your what? Minister. He says somebody's going to be great in our, in Christendom, in Christianity, that person's going to be the servant. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to minister to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And then, of course, you remember that Jesus pulled out a towel and he washed the disciples' feet toward the end of his ministry. And it was something that normally someone else would do. And even oftentimes Jewish people would not even do it. They would have someone, a slave, or pay someone to do that. And Jesus took the towel and began to wash the disciples' feet. And boy, it was really awkward. Very awkward for the people. And, and Jesus did it to get it across them. Listen, this is what it's about. Serving one another. And in the church family, that's something that God has gifted many people to do. They're not people that necessarily look for the limelight. They don't need the, the they don't necessarily need the, the big spotlight, but they are gifted behind the scenes to help and to and to make good things better. Look, if you would please, your lesson, if you would please. The gift of ministry is a spiritual impulse to identify and practically help others by willing service. It is an impulse that, that just causes you to want to help somebody else in a project. You don't want to lead the project necessarily. You're not the one looking to be the leader, but you just want to, to help another brother or sister in the Lord's work. The obvious biblical example is a gift, if this gift is probably Timothy in the Bible. I'll give you quickly seven characteristics that someone might have who has the gift of ministry. Number one, they will naturally care for people. Naturally care. Trying to find a way. It's not hard to do that. It's something that comes natural to them to care for people. Now, Timothy was that way in Philippians chapter 2, and I don't know that I'll take time, but one of the saddest verses in the Bible, let's look at it real quickly if we can. Philippians chapter 2, I think it'd be good for us to, it's one of the greatest verses and one of the saddest verses in the Scriptures. I think recently on a Grace to Grow broadcast, uh, I, I uh, had the opportunity to speak about this. 
The Bible says here in verse number 20 of chapter, of chapter um, of, of, um, 2, he says, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own and not the things which are Jesus Christ. He says, now, he said, I have nobody. He said, I want the people to come see you in, in Philippi. I love that church of Philippi, Paul says, but none of the guys that work with me. And he couldn't name them all off. He didn't name them all. He said, but nobody cares for people and thinks like me like Timothy does. Timothy will naturally. Now, some guys will come and help you if I pay them. Some guys will come and help you if I ask them and they'll do it because I'm their boss and I'm their mentor and they'll do it, but not Timothy. Timothy will do it because he gets to do it. It's the natural thing to care for people. This is a minister. It is natural to care. Number two, seeks to free others to achieve spiritually. I believe that many of the gifts of the, of the, of the deacons in the first, in Acts chapter 6, were men who they, they didn't, they were, even though they became great men who, who used of God greatly, Stephen and Philip and, and, and Niker and all those other fellows, they're great guys, but I think they, they were there to help their apostles have more time for prayer and the ministry of the word. They seek to do the, men, the menial things so that someone who could do only things, for instance, in a church like ours, uh, there can be only one Sunday school teacher in a classroom for the most part, okay? And that's a guy who's, who God has appointed or that's been appointed to teach that Sunday school class. And it can't be everybody get up, oh, let's all teach Sunday school together and we all just stand up and teach in the front of the classroom with nobody out there. No, so someone has to do this. So, so someone else has to say, I have to do things that only that they could do, but I can't do what they're doing, so I will do things to help them achieve spiritually. And boy, selfless people like that. Number three is a, a ministry, natural cares. They seek, to, they seek to, do, to free others of their responsibilities they could do for them so that they can achieve themselves. Then number three, they disregard personal sacrifices. And they struggle to say no. They, they, they don't really care how much it costs them. They don't care how late they'll stay at night. I was talking to Miss Sue Favor about years ago in the, in the, in the uh, sewing room. There was one particular lady, and if there was a project, she didn't care how late at night she had to stay. She didn't care what she had to carry up and down the stairs to the sewing room. She was willing to do it without complaint. And oftentimes, those who are servants, they oftentimes overcommit themselves because they can't say no. They're looking naturally to care for that person. And it's sometimes easy for people who have this particular gift to get so busy that they can't say no to simple things. That they, they need to say, okay, hang on a second. I can't do that well and do this well. They think they can do everything. And they, they don't care about seconds. It doesn't matter how much, it doesn't matter their stuff. Oh, I can use my tools. I can, it's no big deal. I can do that. It's going to be 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't care. I can do it. They're just, they, they, they don't really think about themselves. I think about uh, so many sweet friends that have this particular gift. And it really just, the sky's the limit. They'll do anything to be a help to people. They don't really think about themselves. They think about others because it's part of their nature to care. Number four. And uh, they're keen to recognize and remember special interests or desires of those with whom they serve. They're really keen. They, they pick up on what someone they're serving needs. I think Apostle Paul, uh, Timothy was this guy. At the end of Timothy's life, uh, or at the end of Paul's life, Paul said, could you get Timothy? Timothy, get here. Do thy diligence to come shortly to me. And bring the coat, the coat. I left my coat. He would give him somewhat menial things. It was a big deal. He was cold in the prison. He said, would you mind getting my coat? I don't know that he would have asked Timothy to do that. I'm not sure if he'd ask Epaphroditus or if he would ask Demas, but he asked Timothy. And Timothy already would know. He would already study Paul, and I think he would know what he would need. He was keen to find out what it would, he, oh, he'll like that. No, he won't like that. Don't say that. Take care of that. Now, that's not going to be something that will be, be good. Very keen to pick up on the interest and desires of those whom they serve. Number five, they, give, they need direction and affirmation are needed especially. 
Usually people who are ministers need somebody to help them and give them direction. Not that they're, they're totally direction, but they need, they, need, they need definite direction. You see this two times in, 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 in uh, Paul's writing to Timothy. Do thy diligence to come to me shortly. He said, don't get hung up doing that. Don't get hung up with, with old wives' tales and, and endless genealogies. He had to give him specific directions to do that. He would tell him, endure hardness as a good soldier. Take, take care. He gave him specific directions, and they oftentimes need affirmation. They need someone to let them know. And if, if, a, if a, someone's given a ministry, they don't necessarily want to be, to be put in front of people. They wouldn't like that normally. But they do need the note. They do need to know that the person that they're, that they're trying to please, the Lord Jesus first, but the, that the people, they need to know that they're appreciated in affirmation. By the way, that's not wrong. But we find that that is true. Uh, and I think Apostle Paul, if you read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, you'll see that he had to give him continual affirmation and specific directions. And then he could go and, and really be used of the Lord. These are some attributes I see that are there. And then I would say this, number six, they need short-range projects. Short-range projects, something that's not long-term. For a minister, now someone who is a ruler, somebody uh, who, is, who is a ruler, they can probably look down the long haul. They can, they, or a prophet can see long-term. But usually ministers would get frustrated with a long-term project. But they need something that's kind of short-term, something that they can get right now. Uh, you know, if somebody, if somebody needs something, they're thinking, how can I get that done right now? You know, if, if they need a meal, they don't want to wait till next Wednesday to give it to them. They want to make sure you get it tomorrow. I want to be the first one. I'll take care of it tomorrow. What are they, do they need something tonight? <laughs> that's, the, that's the ministry. They, 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 they gravitate to short, immediate needs that they can take care of quickly. And it doesn't matter their, sacrifice, their sacrifices they make personally. Um, let's look at a couple verses there. I put there with 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number, verse number um, 3. And that's where I've talked about he, he endured hardness as a good soldier. Because sometimes people who are ministers are not always good at, at, at staying with something for a long time. Easily bored with, with opportunities unless they can get to them right now. And to stay at something, he, he used the word endure oftentimes for Timothy because I think he needed that particular one. If you look at verse number, verse number 2, And the things which thou hast heard of me among men that witnesses, same come without a faithful men. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Who should be able to teach others also? And then he says in verse number 3, Thou therefore, what's the next word? Endure. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, but that he may please him who hath chosen to be a soldier. And then he says, let me talk to you about being an athlete. He says in verse number 5, he says, Now if a man also strive for masteries, or this is talking about uh, Olympic competition, similar to that, yet is he not crowned unless he strive lawfully. Don't take shortcuts, Timothy. Keep the rules. And he says, look, number one, endure hardness like soldiers do. Number two, play by the rules. Don't take shortcuts. Sometimes ministers and those who gifted this have a tendency to try to find the easy way. Isn't there a shortcut to that? Do we have to go through that long planning meeting? Or can we get it done just with one, two, three, let's go, get it going. They don't want to do the, they don't want to do, they don't want to wait, and they don't want to, they, they're looking for shortcuts. He says, look, Timothy, do the hard thing. Timothy, Play by the rules. You'll never be awarded if you cheat, if you take the shortcut. And then he gives him another example, and that's that of a farmer. Look, if you would please, the next verse, if you would. And the husbandman that laboreth must first be partakers of the fruit. Consider why I say the Lord give the understanding in all things. He said, look like farmers. They just, they don't get out in, in April after they plan their thing and come back home in the afternoon and in, in June, come back home and say, you know what, it's a terrible day. I didn't get one kernel of corn all day long. I'm wasting my time. No, he has to wait till harvest. He said, T Timothy, uh, you are impatient. You want to just do everything right quick, and you're, and you're wanting to get these, all these needs met. It takes some time, hard times. It takes, some, it takes no shortcuts. 
Life is not a, a, a hundred yard dash, it's a marathon. You have to have some endurance. And then you have to be patient like a husband and a farmer that's going to continue to work at things. And then look at the next, number seven. Uh, those who have the gift of ministry can from time to time struggle with priorities and endurance. And I've shared that with you just now. Um, let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. If we can, 1 Timothy 4, 16. We'll read it out loud together. Thank you for bringing your Bibles. Thank you for turning the Scriptures. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. And let's read it together, can we please? Take heed to and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Sometimes ministers can get so busy in the work of the Lord, they can forget the Lord of the work. They're doing they're being, they're, they're taking care of stuff, but they're not spending time in the Word of God. He said, Timothy, take heed to you, to yourself, and then to the truth of the doctrine. In doing that, you'll both save yourself and him to fear you. When you get on airplanes, they always tell you, listen, we don't expect a, a loss in air and cabin pressure, but if we, oxygen is needed, four oxygen masks will come down, and you're going to put one on yourself, and you're going to put that there, and it tells you how to put it on. And they always tell you, if you're seated with someone who needs assistance, uh, put it on yourself first, and then seek to help somebody else. And boy, that's a biblical principle that's very true. You say, well, that's selfish. No, it's not. If you go around the airplane trying to put it on everybody else, you're going to be falling out in the, in the middle of the aisle. You're going to be a casualty. So you must take care of yourself. And he said that, Timothy, you got to watch yourself. And I think these are attributes of true ministers because we can get so busy, busy, busy that we neglect to, to, uh, to take care of our own responsibilities. I appreciate this uh, recently, and I, I thank you, church family, for the great kindness on our one-year anniversary to Linda and myself and the children. But I talked to a man recently, said, Pastor, you're a busy man. And God is using uh, the church, and we love our church, but he's a pastor. Take care of the kids. Take care of Linda. Make sure you do your homework. And I say, you know what? Thank you very much. Because the temperament can be go, 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 and, and fail to take heed to the things that are my responsibility. What are three things that are my responsibility? Number one, my walk with God. No one else can walk with God for me, and no one can walk with God for you. If you don't take care of that one, there's no one else to mop up our mess. We must walk with God for ourselves. That's our responsibility. Number two, our family role. If you're a daughter to your parents, if you're the second daughter, there's no one else that's supposed to do that for your parents. Be there. If you're a husband, be a husband. If you're a wife, be a husband. Be a wife to your husband. If you're a son, be a son. If you're a brother, be a brother. That family role, no one else can play that for you. No one else is supposed to. That's your job. Number three, our personal purity. No one else can do this. All three things. I got to walk with God for myself. I got to play my family role for myself. And I must be pure for myself. No one else is going to be pure for me. I can't be pure for you one second. You can't be pure for me. That's my responsibility. Paul told Timothy many times, keep thyself pure. It's our responsibility on that. Well, what are some guidelines? Well, if you look back at Romans chapter 12, you'll see uh, verse 9 tells um, the, idea, the, the, the guidelines for the prophet. Verse number 10 tells the guidelines for the minister. And read it with me, if you would, please. Chapter 12, verse 10, as we get ready to wrap things up. Ready? Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Here are the three things that those of us who minister need to grab it. If we minister in the, in the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God working through us, first of all, we'll be affectionate people. We must be affectionate, kindly affectionate, be gracious. If I, if I minister in the flesh, I'm going to be sharp with people. I'm going to be looking around saying, hey, you're not working as hard as I'm working. No, you're not carrying your weight. But if I'm, if I'm ministering, in this area, with the Spirit of God's help, I'm going to be very kind and gracious with the people around me, not frustrating. Number two, I'm going to have brotherly love, sibling love. And number three, I will be in honor preferring one another. I will prefer others above myself if I am the minister uh, in, in using this gift. By the way, do you think the church needs these three attributes? Definitely. The prophet says, listen, if you're going to be a prophet... Don't be a hypocrite yourself. Let love be without dissimulation. 
Okay, you're going to abhor evil, but cleave to good. He said, if you're going to be a minister, you need, to, you need to bring the love. By the way, the people who bring love to this body, some of the most valuable lovers in this family, in the church family, that makes this church attractive are the ministers. The people who are looking for other people's needs, they put other people's needs, preferring others above themselves. They're, they love like brethren. And uh, the Bible says in the first part there, they're kindly affectionate. We always gravitate to kind people. We get frustrated with rude, sharp, and short people. Not, not stature, Brother Harold. Just, just... No, people who are sharp or are harsh or crude. Boy, if you came into a church family and said, sit over there. You'd probably say, I'll go to another church and get yelled at if I want to, but I'm not going to come here and do that. You know what makes that is ministers. That's why one of the, one of the gifts I, I am, I'm assuming of many of our ushers who are filled with the Spirit of God, who are gifted to this, they, they, can, make little, they can make big problems little real quick. Why? Because they're kind with their words. They're, they're, they're loving like a brother, come alongside and help somebody. And they put other people's needs above theirs. They still got their jacket on. They're still serving. They're still caring, what, working out for things. And this church needs this particular body of believers to do that. Look at the next thing. What are the benefits? What happens when, you, when the ministers minister? What happens when the prophets prophesy? Well, the gospel keeps on going. The church stays doctrinally sound. And the word of God is propagated. And people are strengthened and built up. But what happens when the ministers minister in the Holy Spirit's help? Well, number one, more work is accomplished. It becomes a, a lot of things can take place in the body of believers. A lot of things. A lot of meals are made. A lot of visits are made. A lot of buses. By the way, this, the bus ministry is probably full of ministers. People who, you know, they buy their own promotion. It doesn't matter. It's no big deal. I don't need Brother Cowan to give me. I don't need Brother Francis to give me anything. We, I, we can do that. It's no big deal. They don't care. They're glad to do it. They put other people's needs before theirs. While most of us are sitting home and bellying up to the table, they're, they're still dropping off kids on a Sunday afternoon and then getting ready to come back for Sunday night. They're driving that bus. They're taking care of things early. It, it doesn't matter to them. They're, they're, they're sacrificial people. They put other people's needs above themselves. Then we find the next thing real quickly is, is that leaders can be more effective in areas of spiritual matters. And it frees up leaders who have gifted to prophesy, to teach, to rule, to do those things because servants are handling those things so other people can achieve more rapidly. And, of course, the, it, frees up the, it frees others people to do their gifts better. And then the lastly, disciples are multiplied. Look at Acts chapter 6 as we close tonight. The last verse we'll look at. In Acts chapter 6, there had been a complaint by the Grecian Christians that their widows were being neglected and the Jewish widows were getting the priority. And it was coming to the ears of the, uh, of the apostles and it was obvious that they couldn't keep up. And so, here's what happened. Verse number, verse number um, 3. Wherefore, brethren, look out among you seven men. Here's what's happened. He said, look, let's find seven of our men out here. They have a good testimony. They're honest report. They're full of wisdom, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost and wisdom, and that we appoint over this business. And we'll give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the Word. And then he, they, hired, they, got these, they, they, they acquired these five, in verse, verse 5, they're the names of the guys. And then I want you to notice in verse 7, what's the word verse 7 say? Read it out loud with me, the first part. And the word of God, and then the number of the disciples, what? In Jerusalem greatly, and great companies of the priests were obedient to the faith. So the word of God increased, the disciples multiplied, and great great uh, conversions were taking place because people played their role and especially those in the areas of ministry. Thank you very much for listening. If you happen to be here tonight and you're not sure if you died, you go to heaven, would you let someone explain that to you? And I pray that God will help us and understand these truths about the spiritual gifts. Thank you for being so faithful. It's a wonderful group on uh, Wednesday night and I appreciate your faithfulness. We have a quick